Welcome to Private Equity Profits. Clifford Locks is a certified board of director, a trusted confidant to CEOs, C-level exec, and high potential employees to help them clarify goals, unlock their potential, and create actionable strategic plans. Seth Green is the nation's foremost authority on growing your portfolio companies with direct response marketing. He is the founder of the direct response marketing firm, Market Domination LLC. And he is an eight-time best-selling author who has been interviewed on NBC, CBS, Forbes Inc., CBS Money Watch, and many more. Cliff and Seth interview top players in the financial sector, focusing on private equity firms, venture capital companies, and family offices, discussing developments and trends shaping the industry. These experts will share with you how they've grown their businesses and increased profit, and how you can too. And now, here's your host, Cliff Locks. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Private Equity Profits Podcast. I'm Cliff Locks, your host. Today we have our guest, Brandon Cobb, CEO of HBG Capital and an expert real estate consultant and investor. He's been featured in REI Wealth Magazine and Forbes. He's here to share some actionable advice about using real estate investing as a way to create passive income and how to hire those A-plus rock stars in systems and processes you can use to grow your business. Brandon, thanks for being here on the show today. Cliff, I'm excited to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Tell me about your background and how you started on the journey that brought you to where you are today. Yeah, so surprisingly, accidental entrepreneur. My background was in medical device sales before I jumped into real estate and was blessed to be sat down one Friday at a Starbucks and relieved from my duties. It's probably one of the most surprising, confusing moments of my life. Ended up turning into a blessing. You know, real estate was something that I did not know that I was going to get into. If you'd asked me seven years ago that we would be building neighborhoods here in Nashville, Middle Tennessee, I would have looked at you like you had seven heads. Mm -hmm. So I sort of fell into it. And uh, we started by wholesaling, flipping houses, uh, kept taking the money, just reinvesting all the profits back into the business. And then really just kept looking for those blue oceans. You know, four or five years ago, that market kind of dried up. It got really saturated. We didn't like the profit margins and the type of deals, the number of appointments we were going on. Um, had it kind of done some accidental new construction projects uh, over that period, realized that we were building these homes faster than we were remodeling some of them and just said, you know, what if we just pivoted and put all efforts towards this asset class right here? And when we did that, we started building a lot of different homes and then we figured out that our niche was that first time home buyer. We really like the affordable housing niche. It's probably the most undersupplied product in the nation right now. And that's pretty much how we did it. It's crazy. I've, I've been blessed to go on an amazing journey. And I, if, if you told me seven years ago that I'd be building homes right now, it looked at you like you had seven heads. Congratulations on a successful career. What was it specifically that drew you to make real estate your final career stop? Well, when I got fired, I was doing three different things. I was doing real estate. I was doing a course to help people break into medical device sales. And I had a motivational plot. I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. So it was more do all, all these things at once and let's see what sticks first. And real estate was the first thing that took off. We found my first deal, scrapped everything else, put all my eggs in one basket. And I still get constant growth and uh, humility from the, the trade. You know, it's not something that I've gotten sick of. I've learned that if I'm doing something that I'm getting burnt out on, don't do that thing anymore. And so I still wake up every single day with excitement with what I'm doing. What are the basics regarding investing? What do you see as the foundation of sound investments? That's a great question. Really, I think it's, it's two things. One is every deal can be boiled down to the person and the deal itself. So and I guess it's a little subjective. If you're looking at it from a, an approach where you're investing in someone, then it's definitely the person, definitely the deal. If it's you, myself, and I'm just looking at the deal, I'm really looking for a few things, right? And our investment thesis is a little different than everybody else, but everything we do has 2008 and 2009 in mind. So what can we do to prevent a market recession, right? All real estate assets and just about all businesses do well when the economy is booming. 
the key is to identify opportunities where there's an inverse correlation in the overall economy and the performance of the asset. So what are those asset classes that do well or have at least been insulated against market volatility when you do get a constriction in the economy? So those are the types of opportunities we look for. A couple of factors that play into that is one, you know, how soon can you get in and out, right? That limits your market exposure. How much equity is there in the deal, right? Can this asset take a 30% hit and still be fine? Or are you going to run into cash flow issues, right? Which market is it in? Is it a market that's a little bit more susceptible? We know from the last recession, you know, states like California, Florida uh, got hit really, really hard. So where is it in relation to some of those other markets? And, you know, what's going to happen to the consumer base when things do turn? Are they going to flow to this market or are they going to flow away to it? So we can dive into it a little bit more, but those are a couple of things that we look at when we're vetting new opportunities. That's insightful. What are the challenges and pitfalls associated with investing in real estate? How do you overcome them? Oh man, I think the biggest problem in this industry is the cheese is moving so fast and there's so many big forces at play that influence it. You know, recently, what's the big one? Inflation, it's crazy. Right. They, uh, they came out last year and said inflation was like 6.8%, but we all know that they manipulate the factors that go into that index. It was probably more like 10 to 14%, depending on who you ask. I mean, that's a big problem. If your investments didn't make that much, then you're pretty much losing money last year. So inflation is a big force to contend with. Um, you know, especially in real estate, you've got a lot of people who are pouring into the industry. Right. There's more money chasing real estate right now than ever before. I just left the build to rent conference that came to Nashville and the cap rate compression you're seeing across the country and commercial is now being felt in the build to rent. And it is just crazy what kind of offers these big build to rent portfolios are getting. I mean, I think it's absolutely nuts. It kind of, I think, hints to something else that may be coming down the path that, you know, someone can see that we can't. But you've got that to contend with. So it's it's moving really fast. There's a lot of different trends that are going on. You've got inflation. Um, you've got crazy asset appreciation. You've got the supply that has just been hemorrhaged from 2008, 9, 10, 11. You know, we're, we're so behind on all of our starts. The biggest contender right now is volatility. I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen because nobody can predict how these big forces are going to interact with each other and push on each other. So that's probably the biggest contender right now is volatility. Nobody knows really what's going to happen. So everyone's trying to position themselves as safely as they can against it. So when you borrow money or you have investors money, when do you usually return those assets back to those? Usually it's in 12 months. We're building homes. We're not, you know, we've got phases set up. So 12 months or less usually. You know, we got into commercial last year. It's still an asset class that we're figuring out. So we're not holding people's money for four or five years, like in a commercial asset base. That's one of the reasons why most of investors like working with us is you can actually see what's going on and get your money back within a year. And it's, there's liquidity to it. You can choose whether or not to reinvest. Thank you for sharing that. You pride yourself on finding the best candidates, as you put it, the A plus rock stars for your team. How can you identify such candidates? And what are the tips regarding that? Yeah, so I'm a huge Who Not How fan. I don't know if you can see it over here, but I actually keep this book by my desk as a constant reminder. So we've got a pretty extensive hiring program. So first, uh, biggest mistake people make about this book is they think, oh, Who Not How, I need to just go hire somebody. So there's two things that we do in our hiring process. One is we use behavioral style interviewing. We want to actually hear stories of times they've elicited the skills, not just asking them to latent questions like, all right, tell me about your greatest weakness or, you know, what's your greatest strength? You know, if I'm, if I'm hiring for like a sales position, I might ask, tell me about a time you got a customer to talk about the problems or tell me about a time you got a customer uh, to um, talk about the problems and tell me about how you're able to change their mind on something. So we use behavioral style interviews. One second is if that person can't teach me something about this position that I'm not hiring them. For example, right now we're hiring another superintendent, right? So he, he's got the, he's got all the core values of the organization and he, he's got it, wants it, and he's got the capacity to do it. Big EOS model fan. But what we're doing right now is we're actually taking him alongside and doing like a daily, like work day. So no one comes on board without doing an actual work day in our organization. And what we're looking for is 
can they actually perform on the job? We want to see in real time. So if they've currently got a job, we'll make them work on the weekend, come do a two-day work day, something like that. And then uh, the best candidates, the ones who aren't actively employed, because we'll usually do some kind of two-month mock test period before we actually hire them. So those are the two things that we keep in mind. Then it's, do they have the core values? Uh, you know, For example, growth is one of our core values. So during the interview process, the first step before we ever do a work day or a skill assessment is we'll go in and we'll ask some questions like, tell me about the past uh, five books or podcasts that you've listened to. And if they can't tell me that they're not reading books or listening podcasts or doing anything to really better themselves, I know that they don't have that growth core value. And so they're not going to fit here because everybody in our organization is obsessed about getting better. I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. A lot of uh, people like that. You know, if you say that in the interview, like I'm almost positively going to get you on to the next step because I know you've got that growth core value. And then the next is just your typical EOS model. You know, do they have it, want it, and do they have the capacity to do it? So they've got to be able to understand the role and the responsibilities. And then they got to want it. So if they're not following up with us during the interview, if they're not sending a thank you email, I'll purposely just sit and wait for them to reach back out to me. And if they don't, that tells me that they're not really gung-ho about the position. So they got to want it. And do they have the capacity to do it? So great. So they understand the position. They really want it. But do they actually have the capacity? And that's really where that work day comes in, the skill assessment with our other superintendents. Because, you know, you can't really BS somebody that's doing the job and knows how to talk to talk and walk to walk. So we'll do that. So if they've got the core values and all the skills that we have at that point, we think that it's they've checked all the boxes and we'll bring them on board. So you got a solid process that's repeatable and you've trained that process with multiple executives within your organizations. In other words, do you have two or three people interviewing the same candidate and then you guys get together or gals and then you have a meeting on that individual candidate? Yeah, there's usually a phone interview, which is the first right. part. And well, the first part, it starts from the very beginning. Like we ask them to fill out a disk assessment. If they don't follow those instructions by email, then we don't even move them on. After they do that, then they do a phone interview. That's pretty quick. And then if we like what we hear, then at that point, we'll do a Zoom interview. If the Zoom interview goes well, then we'll do an in-person interview. After that in-person interview, they'll usually interview with my partner. If he likes them, then they'll go on and they'll actually do the work day. They'll meet with the other team members. They'll do ride-alongs and stuff. So there's four, five, six touches sometimes to get in. We're, we're very big on culture. If you're not a cultural fit, and we tell them that too, and we tell them what the core, what the core values are. And if we say, hey, look, this is the type of person we're looking for. And if this doesn't sound like you, it's going to be very uncomfortable to work here. So I want to know, does this sound like you? So we really try to hit it home and make sure because we don't want somebody to be brought on board in a position where they're uncomfortable. You bring up something extremely important there. When you talk about the core values of an organization, let's, let's circle back a little bit. The foundation of the vision of success for the founder or CEO of that organization and the board that they're working with has the ability to permeate the whole organization because there's a reason why the company is thriving. But as you continue to hire and the quantity of people that you hire, you know, I'll coach on a global level and I've seen some of my clients, you know, they're in an organization with 50 people, but a year later there's 300. It's a very different type of organization at that point. But the ability for the CEO to come in and really share what their value is. And it could be through video because realize it's maybe too, in, too many individuals to be able to communicate one-on-one -on -one when you get to 300 employees. Mm -hmm. But the tool sets are getting, you know, with video, it's really easy to share those early days, you know, with a new hire at that point. They don't know what, you, what your journey was and the ability to share, look, we're grounded. You know, we're passionate about the employees, the clients, the stakeholders. We expect that type of relationship that you bring forth and you're going to play well. Let's use the word sandbox. You're going to get along with everybody in multiple departments. And if it's not a good fit, let's just separate at this point. And it's okay. That culture is the magic for the sustainability of the organization that we are very much aligned with what we're building and then we can continue to do that over decades. And you suggested earlier, you know, inflation had a major role. You know, I'm assuming is construction, let's talk about some of the raw materials going into that new home. Is it up 15%, you know, year over year? Are you finding the inflation at that level with materials? Yeah, it's bonkers. It is up and down, right? Lumber's the one that's getting all the, man, it's, I mean, gosh darn, it is up 
from last year, it is insane how high it is. Probably as a whole, 15% is about accurate. That's what we're seeing as a whole. If you were to just blend it all together, you're, you're seeing about 15% increase on your construction costs compared to Q3 of last year. Now, what you're not feeling is that cost. You're feeling on the front end, but you're not feeling it on the back end because home prices are appreciating so much that it's getting caught. There's going to come a point where you're not going to get that appreciation that makes up for those costs on the back end and everyone's going to feel a little bit of a squeeze. All right. So we have some history with that. Well, it was more on the collateralized mortgages and the banks had an incentive to go out there and uh, mortgageize individuals that really didn't have the resources without the appreciation to be able to make those payments. So they get in, try to get an investment and a return and then get out as a homeowner. What do you see as the trends in real estate investing sphere? And is there any way to take advantage of them? But we also understand that we're in inflationary period of time. I don't think there's anything that's going to tame that well. And we may very well be heading into a recession because you know, I see the political, well, the global situation, you know, you just can't run the printing presses and not expect there's going to be a reaction, you know, in the financial markets and, you know, the individual that's running this country at this point thinks he can run the printing press and it doesn't have any impact with inflation. And, you know, it's not accurate. So what are your thoughts on that investment sphere and, and taking advantage of some of the items that will be able to appreciate, handle the recession? And come out okay. I'll give my, you know, my opinion on what the trends that I'm currently seeing, and then you know, I'll give, so I'll give my opinion on, you know, what I think is going to be best uh, structured to handle if we do have a global expression. As far as trends go, oh my gosh, build the rent is hot. There's so much money that's pouring into it. I had six hedge funds call me in December asking to buy all of our inventory. I mean, that's a very unique approach that you didn't see, you know, years ago. I. Used to, you know, builders were limited to one disposition method, right? Retail consumers. That was it. Now you've got these national home builders that are selling whole neighborhoods to these build the rent people. I mean, that's great if you're a builder, right? You can get rid of your whole inventory in one fell swoop. I mean, that limits, eliminates a lot of market risk. That's one trend that I'm seeing. Cap rates are continuing to be compressed in the commercial world. I think that's where you're seeing a lot of money start to pour into the build the rent space. You're seeing a lot of interest in commercial assets that have strong tenants. So especially medical facilities, these commercial buildings where there's there's uh, medical tenants, um, you know, surgeons, doctors, offices, dentists, stuff like that. Um, that's what I'm seeing. Now, what do I feel like is going to be a good investment for when the economy turns? Um you know, just you got to look at the past, right? Nobody's got a crystal ball. One of the big reasons why we invest so heavily in affordable housing and not not to be confused with like Section 8 or low income housing. I'm talking about a first time home buyer home, right? It's affordable new construction home. It's got the lowest supply, highest demand. No matter what happens with the economy, certain needs are always going to be there. One of those needs is they need a roof over their head. They need somewhere to live. And so when you get these constrictions and people don't have as much money and there's not as much money circulating in the economy because the feds uh, constricted the monetary supply. Uh, what do they do? They seek more affordable living arrangements. That's, you know, affordable new construction, affordable housing. They are always going to want a new home versus a, an old home. Um, they look at class B and class C value add multifamily, right? They want to go into an asset that's affordable, but not in a war zone, right? They don't want to get shot coming home from work. Um, assisted living facilities have a great runway. I mean, you've got baby boomers that are, I think there's like 10,000 baby boomers retiring a day. I mean, that population is going to account for a significant increase here in the future. And, you know, baby boomers who are retiring, that tenant has money, right? It has a retirement account. It qualifies for government assistance programs like Medicaid. So assisted living facilities where your tenant base, usually there's not a lot of turnover, um, your tenant base is growing by leaps and bounds every single year. They're well capitalized. I think that's another class that's going to do really well. Storage units, right? Really tough to find good deals right now because of the cost of land, but storage units traditionally do really well. What do people do when economic contraction occurs? They move and they usually downsize and something more affordable. Well, they need a place for all their stuff right? That's never going to go away. I think those asset classes, that's where we're really focused on. Play your cards right and you're in the right assets. No matter what happens with the economy, you can still do well. 
So that due diligence process that you go through to look at the financial analytics is critical at this point because you've got a, a huge influx of funds, not just from here domestically, but coming in from overseas that's looking to get put to work. Especially and, Russia <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a whole nother... The Russian people do not want this war in Ukraine. There's just no doubt in my <laughs> mind at all. They are, you know, we got a tyrant run in that country. We'll see what happens with that. I'm assuming we're going to hear some news <laughs> somewhere along the line. There's going to be a change in leadership. But your ability with the due diligence and, and that influx of cash that's coming in, that's inflating these assets, it's interesting how you will help your investors where you're in and you're out in a shorter period of time. You suggest you're putting the money to work in a year. That actually provides that level of safety for them versus tying up that asset for five years. So, you know, working with you and your team is a very valuable conversation to have. Um, when you look at a starter home, about how many square feet are involved for that home? Starter homes anywhere between 1,500 and 1,800 square feet. Okay, so that's all right. It's a starter home. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Is the permitting process, you guys get it down to a science and you're really, really good at it? Because, you know, I see some places it's not easy. Yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons why we invest in South Florida, Middle Tennessee, is they're very friendly towards businesses. Yeah. Now, the local politicians are feeling the squeeze in Nashville. They do need to start doing something about it because, man, I mean, permits went up like by 30% this year. It's crazy how much growth Middle Tennessee is experiencing. But uh, the Davidson County Corps, you know, it is getting tougher to do that. And but it's still not as not even near the level like New York or California. You know, we're pulling permits sometimes, you know, six to eight weeks. Oh, um, now, now, entitlements, that's a different story if we're entitling or rezoning the land. But that's why I love this area is because it's it's a shorter process and we can put the land under contract and have it contingent on being able to get it permitted before we buy it. That's one of the biggest things we do. We don't buy any land unless we've got a permit in hand and we're ready to rock and roll. We've done the geotech on it. We've you know, radared the land. Everything's pretty much good to go. So that's, that's a pretty big risk factor that we're able to just throw out the window where I was at a conference in January talking to a builder and I asked, well, so what do you do with this land that takes a year or two years to pull a permit on? And he's like, well, we have to buy it. And then we put it through the process and hope nothing goes wrong with it. And I go, hope nothing goes wrong with it. Are you serious? And he goes, yeah. I go, well, what happens if something goes wrong with it? He goes, well, we just sell it and try to recoup whatever we lost. And I was like, that's insane. I would never do a deal like that. So right now it's still really good, especially in the tertiary markets around Nashville, the suburbs, we're, we're getting pretty deep with, with the people that we need to. We've got the right relationships built. You know, our permit expediter used to work for the city for 15 years. So he, you know, who not how, right? So he's got all the relationships and we pay him uh, pretty well to be able to pull things through in a timely manner. You got a good process. I want to salute you and your team. You really understood the forensics of the financial deal and you don't have the risk on the front end. So you got an option at that point. You bought the option and then you go out and you get your permitting. Mm -hmm. You do your due diligence a little further. And at that point, you can exercise that option on that real estate. Is there anything I haven't touched on that you'd like to add or expand on? I'm just thinking of your listeners in mind, and a lot of them are probably looking for you know investments. Maybe they're new to doing due diligence. Maybe they're not. You know, maybe we could touch on you know if they're thinking about investing money with an operator or a sponsor. Maybe some of the things that they should look for. What do you think? I think it'd be a wonderful education. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is what we do. One, we give a list of all the projects that we've done. Right. So if you're gonna Whoever you're going to invest with, make sure that they've done it, right? You can't change anything for experience. So list the past projects. If you can fly in town and see some of their actual deals, I highly recommend that you do that. I also recommend that, you know, look at the deal. When they send the deal to you, numbers are great, but ask for an itemized budget. Just because they send you an Excel sheet saying that the build cost is $4 million, well, what you should say is prove it, right? So we send itemized budgets down to the cent on every single line item. Next is you want to schedule, right? If they haven't supplied like a Gantt chart, I guess I'm speaking more towards like the builder world here. You need to have a schedule built out of exactly what trade is coming and when in very detailed calendar. 
That's very, very important to do. And then, you know, ask to see their financial, ask to see their balance sheet, you know, look and see how old their LLC is, just because they say they've been in business X number, X number of years. Look that up. Try to do as much due diligence on this person as possible. You know, I uh, I invest money with other sponsors. I don't just invest money in my business. I invest in other people's deals. I get background checks on everybody. Nobody seems to see the value of those anymore. Um, very few people ask me to do one, which is crazy. If you're going to give somebody multiple seven figures, like at the very least, you need to be doing a background check on this person. So um, seems straightforward and common sense, but I'm very surprised by the lack that I'm seeing out there. Those are all very important bases that, that you should cover. Uh, but really, person in the deal, right? How much equity is in the deal, right? How much can that deal decline in value before your principal is going to start to be affected? And then the person, right? Like, what's their experience? Can they manage the asset? What's their background? Those are the two biggest things to simplify everything, the person and, and the deal. You got to look at those two things. And if both those things make sense, do it. But if one of those things stinks, you could have a great deal, terrible manager, it's going to be a terrible deal. You got to have a phenomenal manager. If it's a bad deal, then it's a bad deal. So keep those things in mind whenever you're vetting your operators or your sponsors. So do the due diligence on the front end. We're also looking at a recessionary period of time that's probably coming up. What is that timeline tying up your income? And what is the inflation going to do to the assets that you're not putting to work? So you're losing the idea of value, but again, you got that risk tolerance. Brandon, how can our listeners contact you? Are there any links you would like to share? Yeah, you can learn more about us at hbgcapital.net. I'm on Facebook. You can look up Brandon Cobb. Uh, we have our free information on our website. There's free educational resources at hbgcapital.net. If you have any questions, you want to do a free introductory call, we're happy to talk with you. I love just talking to other entrepreneurs and business owners for fun. It's something I really do. If you'd like to schedule an introductory call, we'd love to learn more about you. I want to thank you so much for your time, Brennan. You have the confidence in your model to providing a recession-resistant passive income. And anyone looking to insulate themselves from the volatility of today's markets could benefit from listening. I appreciate you sharing. I want to thank our listeners. I look forward to being back with you shortly for another episode of the Private Equity Profits Podcast. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC.